refuting that right. But I would remind you that even in the days of Nazi Germany and white supremacy in South Africa, nobody brought to the fore the idea that South Africa doesn't have the right to exist, or Germany doesn't have the right to exist. So it's, it's true also about Israel. So no, I don't think it's about the right to exist. What I think uh, I would like to fight against is the racist nature of the state of Israel. And I would like to see, instead of the racist nature, I would like to see a state for its citizens. I'm a very dangerous man, as Alan Dershowitz said. I believe that Israel should be a democratic state, and I apologize for this. Yes, I do believe Israel has to be a democracy. It's a terrible thing, I know. But, and it's a show that I'm self hating too, but uh, what can you do? Must my parents fall, not me. Not. As for your uh, uh, second point, um, it's very interesting. In, in the, in, up to 1956, as I mentioned, and I mentioned it in more details in my book, had it been up to David Ben-Gurion, the Palestinians who remained in Israel would not have uh, been granted citizenship. They would have been ethnically cleansed. But he was convinced by two very good people. One was Moshe Sharet, who was the second prime minister of Israel. And another one was the Ministry of Minorities, before she agreed, to grant citizenship to these uh, uh, Palestinians. However, Israel has different agendas, different Palestinian groups. The Palestine reality is that there isn't one Palestinian group. Palestinian existence is fragmented. And some Palestinian groups form a direct danger for the Israelis. Some form a second, a, a more uh, a long distance danger. Imagine being an Arab student, a citizen, in the university in which I taught for so many years, and go to lectures of one of the most important persons in that university, Professor Arnold Sofer who has, let's say, 20% of his classmates are Palestinians. And he talks about the demographic danger that Palestinian mothers carry with them. Now, this guy is the main advisor to Ed Ulmar, was the main advisor to Yitzhak Rabin. He was not the main advisor to Fagin that your government is going to allow to enter Canada. He was the main advisor to mainstream Zionist thinkers. The open discourse in Israel, not the open policy, but the open discourse in Israel about Arab citizens is that should they be more than 20%, it would be right to ethnically cleanse them. So I would be sort of doubtful in what theory books in political science this would come out of citizenship. Imagine anyone in Canada, uh, let's say the Jewish community in Canada, imagine that people would be allowed in Canada to say that should the Jews be more than 20%, in Montreal, they should be uh, expelled to Toronto. I don't know if it's if, if, <laughs> being there. I, I know this could be quite a, a, a difficult punishment. So I, I, <laughs> that's, that's, that's unbelievable. We accept it as a normal practice of the democracy. Um, in 1948, uh, countries were forced to recognize Israel as a country. I mean, Poland, Soviet Union, and also permitted thousands of Jews to live in Islam and go to Israel in the 40s and 50s. And as it was seen as expansion of communist ideas, because it propagated no private property and common property, and was communist countries also uh, important in promotion of Israel, not only Western country. And I want to say that 20 years before Israel was created, uh, Soviet Union created a Jewish state in Far East called Abidjan, which is a little bigger than Israel as far as territory. And uh, uh, it, in Eastern Siberia, near Vladivostok. And uh, also, when I visited Israel, um, part of Israel are as empty as Canadian prairies. And uh, I'm talking about the corner between Lebanon and Syria, Golan Heights, or south of the country. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure it was a question. I think you enlightened us about the important aspects of history. So mm -hmm. I thank you. I thank you for that. Was there a question? Did I miss? Uh, 
There was no question, right? The question okay. was the okay, thank you. He was asking about the importance of Oh, the importance. Of I think he was stating the importance. Communist. No, definitely communist, uh, communist countries played a role. Uh, had it not been, I would just mention one thing. It's very important to remember that. Had it not been to the Soviet Union in 1947, Israel, uh, or the young state of Israel, would have lost in two battles. The Soviet Union was the main arms supplier to the Jewish army that executed the ethnic cleansing. And the support of the Soviet Union to the partition plan in the United Nations that legitimized the state of Israel was as important as the American support. So definitely in 48, communism in the form of communist states plays from an Israeli Zionist point of view a very positive role. It's only later that this role is being replaced by a different Soviet uh, policy, uh, in fact, around the 1950s after the Suez uh, fiasco. Thank you. Uh, now, you have mentioned at the beginning of your break here. <laughs> where, where are you? You're here? OK. Thank you. Now, you have mentioned at the beginning of your uh, enlightening lecture that the whole scheme, the whole design behind the state of Israel was to bring the European Jewish population closer to realizing two goals, security and self-determination. Now, I understand that the first goal, the second goal, actually, self-determination has been realized since 1948, whereas security has been constantly questioned since, since that time and more uh, manifestly compromised in the last uh, Hezbollah-Israel war in 2006. This being the fact, my question is, has the idea of Israel lost any of its appeal to the non-Israeli Jewish individual? To the non-Israeli Jewish um, I don't know yet. Uh, it's, it's, it's early days. I, I do agree with you that ever since the creation of the State of Israel, the claim that uh, Israel is a secure place for Jewish people is a bit problematic, given the fact that that's the only place where Jews are being killed. Uh, and so I'm not sure that, as a salesman, I would be able to sell the place as a good insurance uh, for security, and it's not getting better. Um, as for uh, the uh, question of the Jews around the world, it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say. I'm, I'm not sure also that their affiliation to Israel is only about security. I think it has other deeper uh, reasons why they would associate uh, with Israel. Um, but I do think that there are changes. There are changes on two, for two reasons, I think. But uh, I'm not an expert on it. One has to check it. One is the fact that many of many members of the Jewish community know now what Israel is doing and find it very difficult to identify with it. And I think they don't want to be at least directly associated with it. And secondly, I think that Jewish communities in certain countries around the world, especially in the Western world, feel very secure in their identity even without the connection to Israel. But these are early days for these two processes. So I think we'll have to wait and see. It's another key for a different reality as a progressive Jewish voice that would uh, take the same Jews who were spearheading the protest uh, in the name of civil rights in America uh, in the Vietnam War, against the Vietnam War, against Pinochet in Argentina, and apartheid South Africa, to take these same sentiments and feeling and apply them also in the case of Israel. That would be an eye-opener very important historical moment. <laughs>